Okay, so hi everybody. Um, I wanted to do a midterm review so that you guys have an idea of what you have coming on the midterm. So um, I'm gonna share my screen and then we will get, get it going. Okay, cool. So <clears throat> you should be able to see my screen. Um, all right, so your midterm is covering and I'll, I'll type as I speak. I'm gonna do some example problems too of the different topics on it, which hopefully should help make you feel more comfortable for it. Um, so first things first, uh, this might be a little bit of a longer video, but that's because I'm gonna do a lot of examples. First thing is it is an untimed exam. Um, it's not proctored, okay? There are 31 questions off the top of my head. Um, it's pretty straightforward in the sense, like what I cover here is pretty much what is gonna be you know, on it. Um, I would say you can uh, use a reference sheet, create a reference sheet. Please don't use all of your notes because if you're dependent on all of your notes, it may take you a long time. It can be stressful. You know, you wanna make sure you understand the information. So the idea is to review such that you create a nice reference sheet so that if you have something you need to just reference, you could just look at that real quick. Um, you could use a basic calculator. You don't need anything crazy in terms of a calculator for this one. And then um, it's covering weeks covers material in weeks one through, I should actually say chapters one through six. So it's not including chapter seven. And this is all on the syllabus too. I want you to like check the syllabus, make sure um, it is due at the end of the week. Um, and if you have any questions, just email me past this. If I'm not answering everything here, email me. I'm going to also share these notes in the announcements while I also send the video. So let me just plug in my computer. All right. Um, so I'm just going to go through some examples, some of them quickly, some of them maybe not as quickly. So you had some of these topics. I can't remember exactly which chapter it's from. I want to say this was more like chapter one-ish, maybe maybe chapter two um, off the top of my head. But this is just to determine the difference between valid arguments and invalid arguments. So I hope this is kind of second nature to you, but <clears throat> um, some valid arguments are more intuitively valid than others. Here's a valid argument that you probably have no problem accepting. The idea is that for a valid argument, there ha it has to be true, if that makes sense. So like if Ralph is a dog, <laughs> no dogs are allowed on the roller coaster. Therefore, Ralph is not allowed on the roller coaster. There's no nothing that can contradict that because of, because of the first two statements. If I can come up with something that can contradict um, that last statement based on the first two statements or based on something else, then it's an invalid argument. I have to be able to accept that last statement without a contradiction. Every dog is a reptile. Every reptile is cold-blooded. Well, since every dog is a reptile and every reptile is cold-blooded, therefore every dog is cold-blooded. I have to accept that based on the first two um, statements. Um, being friendly is the easiest way to make friends quickly. Alana has a lot of friends, therefore she must be very friendly. She may not, um, she may not have a lot of friends based on the fact that she's friendly. I can contradict that last statement. I don't, um, the first two statements don't make that last statement true. So that would be considered invalid. That's kind of how you determine whether it's valid or invalid. Um, if the last statement is definitely true, if you cannot come up with like a contradiction based on the first two statements. Just a quick review of that. Um, I'm gonna do this one first. So conditional statements, your if then statements, you'll see those. These are typical standard kind of intro to um, like pre-algebra type stuff. So you might be teaching it. Um, a conditional statement, also an if then statement, if is a statement with a hypothesis followed by a conclusion. So a lot of times what they do is they want you to determine the hypothesis. They want you identifying the conclusion. Sometimes they give you them and create the if then statement. Sometimes you're given the if then statement and you need to determine which is the hypothesis and conclusion. I think this is pretty easy to um, <laughs> hypothesis. If this is true, then 
And and if then statements, they're really common in mathematics too. If you ever go into higher level math, the if then statement is all over mathematical proofs. But um, you know, if this is true, then that is true. So uh, like for example, here, uh, here's a statement. I will bring an umbrella if it rains. So the hypothesis would be if it rains, but based on the fact that if it rains, then I will bring an umbrella. So, you know, they don't have to be in the proper order. You can create the if then statement from that um, statement here. Um, all right angles are 90 degrees. Hypothesis, if an angle is right, then it is 90 degrees. So you can create these if then statements from any of these statements um, and then identify the hypothesis and the conclusion. If you work over time, then you'll be paid time and a half, hopefully. <laughs> so the hypothesis would be the if you work over time, and then the conclusion would be then, right? You'll be paid time and a half. So the then is based on the if. Um, pretty standard, not too bad. Um, I want to, like I said, this video might be a little bit longer only because of the fact that I want to cover at least all the topics on the midterm. So you could fast forward, you could rewind to anything that you need. Um, I'm gonna go as fast as I can, but also trying to, um, you know, help you understand the topics if you don't. So, set this up. This one, <clears throat> so you will see Venn diagrams. Venn diagrams, ah, you can't really get rid of them. You know, they're all over, basic math, they're all over even, even statistics, it's just Venn diagrams. They're a nice way to organize information as well. So I wanted to do a quick example and I'll, I'll create the Venn diagram for this. I might make up some questions. Um, I'll do some notation just to reference that. So let's see what we have. So if a survey asks 200 people, so total 200. And by the way, if I'm setting up a Venn diagram, I always, ugh, try to make a rectangle, try to make a rectangle to represent the total like sample space. And then um, depending, I don't know how many circles I'm gonna have, depending on how many situations I have, let's see. Um, a survey asked 200 people, what beverage do you drink in the morning? So you have a tea only, a coffee only, or tea and coffee. So it sounds like I only have two options. So I'm gonna try my best to draw a beautiful circle. I'm not gonna use, there we go. Um, I want more on my intersection in case I need space there. Okay, so I'll let this be my coffee circle and I'll let this be my tea circle. And you know what? I might also call this A and call this B just in case I wanna use the notation. Um, that's what I'll reference as A and B. This is my total sample space. And if you're unfamiliar with this, this is how I read this. Where the two, Circles overlap is called the intersection of the two. Um, this is the intersection of A and B. This is where both are occurring. This circle here, this whole circle represents A, but the whole circle for A represents all of A, including the intersection as well. And you have to remember that because sometimes um, that part can get confusing. The whole B circle <laughs> represents all of tea drinkers, um, including the intersection as well tea drinkers that only drink tea and tea drinkers that also tea drink coffee. So if I'm looking at this part of A, you know, like this part of A without considering the um, overlap here, then I'm only talking about coffee drinkers and not coffee and tea drinkers. Okay, same thing as like this section here. Um, but you don't wanna forget what we call the complement of this um, situation where outside of these circles represents everybody who doesn't drink coffee and or tea. There are people that don't drink coffee and tea. There are people that don't drink either coffee or tea. So that is part of our um, Venn diagram. You can't forget them. Sometimes we forget them. So, <laughs> excuse me. Um, suppose 20 report tea only, 80 report coffee only, and 40 report both. I like to do the both first um the intersection and both coffee and tea that's here this is 40 and um sometimes they'll say this amount drink tea 
And it, it matters whether they say like this amount drinks tea or whether this amount drinks tea only. So if, if they were to tell me that, let, let's just say 60 people drink tea period, that means um, this whole circle here would be adding to 60. But because they tell me 20 report tea only, this outside portion, not inclusive of the overlap is 20. So now I know a total of 60 people drink tea, period. Whether they drink coffee and tea or drink tea only, they drink tea. 80 report coffee, so coffee only, that's important. Because if they told me that 80 report coffee, then I would have to consider the whole circle. But because they're telling me coffee only, then I know that this here is 80. So that means that 80 plus 40, 120 people drink coffee, period. Well, the thing is, um, there's 200 total people that we're talking about here. And um, if I add up these three, if I go 80 plus 40 plus 20, I'm only getting 140. And I need to have 200 people represented. So that is where this outside of the circles comes into play. So what's the leftover? I have to account for those 60 people. There's 200 people in the survey. So the 60 people are here. 140, adding here, 60 out here. So if I add up all the numbers in my Venn diagram, it should add up to my total, in this case, 200. Now I can determine how many people drink only tea, how many people drink only coffee, how many people drink whatever question they ask me. <laughs> let me see what I have here. Um, let me color coordinate a little bit. How many people drink tea, period? Not tea only, tea. Well, I said to you that that's pretty much my T circle. In this case, my B circle, because I labeled it as B. But that's the sum of these two. That's inclusive of the, of the overlap. So 40 plus 20, I already kind of talked about that. 60 people drink, oops, tea. How many people drink, let me go on, 60. Um. I'm gonna add a little question here just because how many people let me just say drink coffee? Well, that's a total coffee circle or my A circle, 80 and 40, which I said was 120. How many people drink neither tea or coffee? I kind of already spoke about that on the head. I'm already thinking about these questions before they ask me. Neither tea or coffee, neither. What does neither mean? Well, everybody but that, the compliment, that's that 60 here. That's that 60. That's why you have to consider that part too. Now I want to just kind of um, deal with the notation. And so let's do the intersection of A and B. So if you see the notation, you have to know what it means. The upside down U is an intersection, A intersecting B. So in that case, that's the 40. Um, if I see the U like this, this is the union. It, it includes everything. It includes the 80, the 40, and the 20, all of the circles, in other words. Okay, that's the union. Um, if I talk about, um, let's do A union B complement, by the way, this little tick mark is the complement. If I talk about the union, A union B, which is everything in the circles, including the overlap, including everything, but I want the complement of that, that's everything but that, that's the 60. That's kind of like saying neither tea or, or coffee. So um, the notation is important as well. You have to know both, whether you're doing the application or just asking questions based on the, the notation. Um, what if I do like A complement intersecting B? A is here. The complement of A is everything but A. So that's everything outside of that circle. If I were to make an ugly mess and shade it, which I'll try to take it off, everything but A. So I'm gonna start with that first, everything but A. That includes all this, <laughs> all of that. But intersecting with B, intersecting with B. So intersecting with B outside of A is just this 20 here. So um, it's important to practice the notation, go really slowly. If I were to say, for example, I'll try to do another one. 
um, A intersecting B complement. This is saying everything outside of B, everything outside of it, everything but B, but intersecting with A. So that's that 80. So play around with the different notation and see if you can figure, you know, just play around with it and see um, what you could figure out. But you need to understand Venn diagrams, whether you're given a situation in real life or whether you're given notation. Okay. Again, I'm going to be, you know, going through stuff. Um, you have to know the difference between rational and irrational numbers. I hope this is pretty basic, pretty easy. Rational numbers basically can be converted into fractions um, or represented as fractions. Put it like that. So, for example, um, two-thirds is a rational number. Negative three is a rational number because negative three over one is a fraction. Um, the square root of four is rational because it simplifies into two. Don't let them fool you with those square roots. Um, the square root of 25 is rational because it simplifies to five. However, irrational numbers, we call non-terminating, non-repeating decimals. And what does that mean? That means um, they don't end and they don't repeat. So like a repeated decimal, for example, 0 0.333, if that keeps going forever, can be represented as a fraction one third. Those repeated decimals can be converted into fractions. They are rational. But if I have um like pi, which is approximately 3.14, but it keeps going forever and it doesn't end and it doesn't repeat, this is an irrational number. The square root of two, if you plug into your calculator, is a non-terminating, non-repeating decimal. It keeps going on forever. But the square root of four is rational because it simplifies into two. But the square root of two doesn't simplify. So therefore, it's irrational. The square root of 45 can be simplified, however, not into just a number, three rad five. And I'm, I'll, I'll show an example of that next. So rational versus irrational numbers, not too bad, but... Um, don't let them fool you with some of these radicals and some of these repeating decimals, okay? Repeating decimals can be converted into fractions, so they're rational. Radicals, these are called radical expressions with the square roots, can be converted if they're simplified. If they're simplified into like a whole number, they're rational. But these radicals that cannot be simplified into whole numbers are irrational because they're non-terminating and non-repeating. And then things like pi you've seen, I don't know if you guys will ever see E. E is another constant. Oh, off the top of my head, 2.7, 2.7 something, 2 point something is another um, special number. Just like pi is a special number when it comes to circles, E is a special number when it comes to exponentials. If you guys get to that, um, it's also an irrational number. You probably won't see it here, but just, just for reference. <laughs> um, I'll come back to radicals. I'm just going to do these quick things first because I think that um, they're standard. You probably already know it. Prime numbers, only divisible by one in itself. Things like 13, only divisible by one in 13. Composite number can be divisible by anything. You know, have multiple factors. Multiple, I'll say multiple factors. Um, other than just one. So um, a factor is something that maybe I have to review too, but examples of prime numbers, 13, um, seven, I'm not in order, but composite numbers, nine, because it's divisible by one, three, and nine, 10, Prime num uh, composite numbers, they don't have to always be odd, by the way. But every even number is composite because it is every even number is divisible by two. <laughs> All right. Those are like quick. I don't want to take up too much time, right? You can always fast forward um, to what you want. So uh, let me do some radicals. Um, radicals. I love radicals, to be honest with you. You have to know how to deal with radicals. And you're really only doing square roots, but there are other radicals outside of that. Um, but you're focusing on square roots here. 
So like I um I think, for example, we all know the square root of nine and things like that. By the way, if you don't, I'm gonna put this here. You need to know your perfect squares. You need to know them. Because if you don't, um, it's going to make taking square roots a little bit more difficult. And I'll write some of them out, but you need to know these. And also get really good with your multiplication if you're not, because you need to know some good factors and such. But perfect squares, you know, obviously one squared is one, two squared is four, three squared is nine, four squared is 16, five squared is 25, six squared is 36. You should know up to, and actually I'll write them down in the notes, but you should know at least, at least up to like 13, maybe up to 15. Um, I'll write them here. But if you don't know them, you definitely want to either write them down, go through them, practice them because you need to know them. It's going to make your radicals much easier because when you're taking a square root, you're trying to figure out what number multiplied by itself gives me nine. Well, I need to know what my perfect squares are to basically determine that nine is a perfect square. And because nine is equal to three times three, the square root of nine is three. It's almost like a backwards version of these perfect squares. So like, I'll just call this A and B. So like the square root of 16, I can do this. This simplifies. This is going to be a rational number because it is a perfect square. And because four times four or four squared is 16, then the square root of 16 is four. You may see radicals though, that are not that, uh, you know, like evident and in your face, the square root of 45. I can simplify this mathematically. We always simplify everything mathematically. 45 is not a perfect square, but there is a factor of 45 that is. 45 can be represented as nine times five. And we are allowed to do this with radicals, with multiplication of radicals, only multiplication, okay? This does not apply with addition of radicals, just multiplication. I'm allowed to say that the square root of five, the square root of 45 is the same as the square root of nine times the square root of five. Why do I do that? Because nine is a perfect square. I try to pick a factor of the number that is a perfect square if I'm simplifying radicals, square roots. I can simplify the square root of nine into three times. This can't be simplified, the square root of five. And so the square root of 45, when we represent it in its simplified form, is three times the square root of five. This is an irrational number, if I'm referring to that. Same thing as like the square root of 200. I'm trying to think of a factor of 200 that is a perfect square. You know, what times what will give me 200? You know, one of them should be a perfect square. And I hope that you recognize that 200 is 100 times two. And why do I choose 100? Because 100 is a perfect square, right? The square root of 100 is 10 because 10 times 10 is 100. So this can simplify into 10 times the square root of two. This is an irrational number. It doesn't simplify perfectly because it's not a perfect square completely. So this is just the process of simplifying radicals, which is really important. Um, and where you see radicals is oh, this guy, the Pythagorean theorem. You will see, you are never, you're going to see this all over the place. I mean, A squared plus B squared is C squared should be embedded into your brain. Might need to make a shirt of this because you just can't get away. This is one of those things that you just cannot get away from. Um, this applies to what we call right triangles only, only, not any triangle. It has to be for a right triangle and right triangles, right triangles only. A right triangle is um, a triangle that has a right angle in it. Uh, these two sides that create the right angle are called the legs, and they're always the shortest sides. The longest side is always what we call the hypotenuse. It's the hypotenuse. This is a leg, and this is a leg. The hypotenuse is always the longest side. It's opposite the 90 degree angle. So um, you may be asked, I don't know, I'm just gonna make up a random thing. Let's say I have a rectangular situation 
whatever it might be. Um, one side is, I don't know, 10. The other side is two. I'm hoping it doesn't simplify perfectly. And I wanna determine the diagonal, right? I wanna determine the, the diagonal from you know this point to this point. What is that distance? When, when, you're dealing, when you're dealing with a rectangle, square, you have right angles. And if I pull this out, by the way, opposite sides of rectangle are equal. If I pull out a specific part of this, um, call it coordinating. If I pull out this part, if I draw it beautifully, and I take it and I put it over here, and I want the diagonal, this is what's want, what I want, this is 10 and this is two, I have a Pythagorean theorem situation. Diagonals of squares, diagonals of rectangles, or just simplifying and finding, you know, the side of a right triangle. And it doesn't matter which side. If I have two sides of a right triangle, I can find the third side. So it could be the hypotenuse is unknown. It could be a leg unknown. It doesn't matter. Um, and it doesn't matter which one of these legs is A and B, but it does matter which one is C. The hypotenuse is always C, okay? This could be A, this could be B, vice versa, it doesn't matter. However, the hypotenuse has to be C. So if I plug this into my formula, we'll call this A, call this B. Um, again, doesn't matter, right? Because the triangle could be flipped in any way, as long as I'm talking about the legs for A and B. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. I make an equation, um, simplify, in this case, 10 squared, perfect square, 100, 2 squared, 4, and simplify if I can. On the left-hand side, I get 104. Be careful that you don't accidentally multiply, you're adding. 104 is equal to C squared. Why are radicals applicable here? Because in order to solve for C, you have to square root both sides. It's called the square root property. You're not dealing with that yet. Um, but <clears throat> that's what we do when we have a situation like this. Um, when we have something squared equal to a number, we square root both sides. That gives me just one C is equal to the square root of 104. And then I see if I can simplify that if possible. Uh, what is that? Does that simplify? I'd, I'd play around and I don't have my calculator. I'd play around with perfect squares. I'd probably try four, um, 104 divided by four actually is, um, it does divide. And the reason that I'm trying four is because if this is going to simplify, then I want a factor of 104 that is a perfect square. And the reason I picked four is because there are divisibility rules. When it ends in a four, the two numbers, are the, the last two numbers are divisible by four, then the whole number is divisible by four. At the end of the day, you know, two is not enough because two is not a perfect square. If I have to continue to simplify, then I can. But this is uh, four and 26. And the square root of four is two. And 26 does not have another perfect square in it. So we would represent C this way. If they ask me to round, two times the square root of 26, depending on how they ask me to round, 10.198. Let's just say that um, because rounding is important too, you might be asked to round a specific way. Let's say you're rounding to the nearest 10th. This is your 10th place. If I'm rounding to the nearest 10th place, which is this one, this one is going to you know either stay or go up. I'm either going to keep it as a one or, or, or convert it to a two. And the way that I determine whether I keep it as a one or go to a two is looking at the number next to it. If this number next to it is bigger or equal to five, greater than or equal to five, then I go up. In this case, it's a nine, which means that this is going to go to a two. When I'm rounding to the nearest tenth, if I were rounding to the nearest hundredth, that would be this place, then I would look at the eight. The eight would tell the nine to go up. Nine can't go up in a single digit, so it would go back here, 10.20. Okay, so these are radicals, Pythagorean theorem. And you might have Pythagorean theorem directly asked of you, or maybe in a little application. But if you hear anything about a diagonal, that's an indication 
of the Pythagorean theorem. Um, common factors in GCF. Maybe I'll come back to that. I think that that's something that you guys probably know. Let me do some scientific notation. This is really important because you see it when you deal with extremely small numbers or extremely large numbers, which can go into chemistry, physics, uh, math, aerospace, astronomy, like any number that's really in the microscopic or macroscopic world. And obviously there's a lot of those, but any number that's really big or really small is typically represented in scientific notation. Um, and I'm gonna be real extreme here. So like, I'll do this with example. You need to go back and forth between scientific notation and standard representation of a number. So I'll do two examples, oh, maybe I'll do a four examples. Um, if I have a number, like this is a big number, you know, if I wanna represent this number over and over and over again, I don't wanna write it all the time like this. So another way to do it is to represent it in scientific notation. When you're writing scientific notation, um, you always should have the decimal after, look, this is the ones place. You should never have more than a ones place to the left of the decimal. That's how you kind of know where to put the decimals. Always gonna be after the first number. Um, especially when it's a big number like this. And every time we do scientific notation, we have times 10 to the something exponent. We always have times 10 to the something. This is standard. A number always times 10 to some exponent. There's an exponent on the 10. Um, and if I want to make the number larger, like this one, if I need to make this bigger so that it moves the decimal to the right, I need this exponent to be positive. So um, I need to move this decimal to the right. How many places? Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine places to the right in order to make it match the initial number. That means that this is going to be a positive nine as that exponent. 1.23 times 10 to the ninth is the same number, <coughs> excuse me, as, what is this? 1,230,000,000, writing it out with the zeros. Which one is easier? You probably see this more often. But I said it could also apply to the microscopic, which is a very, very small number. I'll just do one, two, three again. Same thing, okay? I'm gonna kind of ignore the zeros because they're in front. I'm focusing on these. If there were a zero in between, actually, let me just put that there, just to show you. I'm ignoring these zeros here, but this zero is important because it's you know contained within those other numbers. I'm still gonna do one point, but I'm gonna do 1.203. I'm still gonna do the times 10 to the, and this exponent I know has to be negative. And the reason I know it has to be negative is because you see this decimal here, it needs to move to the left, however many digits to get, or however many places, to get back over here. It has to go to the left, which means I need a negative exponent. How many times do I need to move it to the left? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times this time. So times 10 to the negative eight. So this number in scientific notation would be 1.203 times 10 to the negative eight. Which one would I write more often? This one in scientific notation. I'm not gonna write this with a bunch of zeros. It's, you know, waste of my time. Mathematic mathematicians. You can imagine we can be lazy at times, you know. Um, I'm gonna go in the other direction because what if you were given, I don't know, 5.407 times 10 to the sixth? What if you were starting with the number in scientific notation and you need to convert it? Okay, positive exponent on the 10 tells me move the decimal to the right. I'm gonna write this number first, move it. Okay, one, two, three four, five, six, comma, comma. Verify, you can always verify. One, two, three, four, five, six. If I were to convert it back into scientific, it would match. You go back and forth, you could verify like however many times you need to to make sure that it's accurate. Um, if you have 7.58 times 10 to the negative four, I'm moving this decimal to the left. 
you can start with these. Sometimes I go one, two, three, four. Verify if I need to, right? From here, one, two, three, four. If I were to convert this back into scientific, it matches. I need to know both directions, okay? Standard to scientific, scientific to standard, both directions. Scientific notation is fun. I, I like scientific notation. Sometimes doing operations with that too makes it a little bit easier. Um, I'm trying to cover everything here. Rationalizing. I'll come back to that. <clears throat> okay. Mixed numbers and fractions. Mixed numbers and improper fractions. You need to know how to go back and forth. And to be completely honest, um, Anytime I'm doing operations with fractions or mixed numbers, I always convert it first. I'm going to show you what I mean. First, let's learn. Two and five sevenths is a mixed number. I have two whole pies and then five slices out of seven. Somebody ate two of those seven slices. So I have two wholes and then I have some of a whole. Mixed number, whole and part. The way that you convert this into what we call an improper fraction, because an improper fraction is a fraction where the numerator is bigger than the denominator. That's it, improper fraction. I'm gonna write that here. Numerator, numerator <laughs> is greater than denominator. So if I'm converting this, right, and I need to know both directions, what you do is you take, I like to go around the world counterclockwise, clockwise, I should say, I meant seven times two. I guess I could write it here. Seven times two. We're going to multiply here and then add here. Seven times two and then plus five all over seven. Okay, um, multiply and then add. So seven times two is 14. And then I add the five, which is 19. So 19 sevenths is the improper fraction because the numerator is bigger than the denominator. It is the same as this mixed number. 19 slices from, from pies that are separated into seven pieces is the same thing as having two whole pies and then five sevenths. Back and forth I go. I have to know in both directions, right? Um, so say, so again, mixed number, I multiply the bottom by the whole and then add the numerator and then put it all over the denominator. I think you probably have done that. I don't know how many times. Um, but I need to know how to go in the other direction as well. So let's say I have, um, make it 13 fifths. I know this is an improper, improper fraction because the numerator is bigger than the denominator. Now you guys kind of have calculators, but if you're doing this by hand, you kind of have to do long division. Five goes into 13 twice. Anything on top here gets multiplied and I subtract. I continue to go if I can go. In this case, there's nothing else to bring. If there was a number here, I'd bring it down. I would keep going, but I'm done. What does this mean? This means I have two holes. This is the whole part, okay? That's the whole part. I just happened to have two again. And then this is the leftover three-fifths, okay? Whole, and then this goes over this. Two and three-fifths is um, my mixed number that represents 13-fifths. And if I want to verify, I can, again, five times two plus three, go back and forth, whatever direction I need to, go back and forth to um, to verify. You know, math is, um, we don't make anything true unless it can go in multiple directions. So you should be able to verify most everything you do. I know that everybody freaks out about fractions, but you have to know you have to know your operations of fractions. Um, I'm gonna do addition, addition and subtraction. They go kind of hand in hand. Addition and subtraction. And the reason they go hand in hand is they need a common denominator. You need a common denominator for addition and subtraction or it's not going to happen. Um, so I'll do an example. 
I'm going to do two and five sevens plus three uh, fifths. I don't know, making it up randomly. So, you know, don't trip out about this. And honestly, I personally, this is my personal opinion, I don't like adding mixed numbers the way they add it. I like to deal with just fractions, improper fractions rather than the mixed numbers. If I need to convert it back, I will. I'll show you what I mean. Before I do this and try to figure out common denominator, I'm going to convert this one into an improper fraction. This is my personal way of approaching this because I think it's a bit easier. Seven times two is 14. I guess I'll show my work. Seven times two. I think I already did this one, didn't I? Okay. I don't typically write this step, but you know, I'm converting it. Seven times two is 14 plus five is 19 sevenths. So I have 19 sevenths and I want to add three fifths. Now I'm comfortable. Okay. I like them in improper fraction form. If I need to go back to mixed number, I will. Um, my common denominator is, is, you know, what is the number that seven and five both go into? It has to be a number that they both go into a common multiple, hopefully the least common multiple, the smallest number that they both go into. And if you need to list the multiples of each, you know, that, that you could do that. Sometimes it's literally just the product of the two. In this case, it is the product of the two. 35 is the least common multiple of seven and five. I need the common denominator. Now, the way that I deal with fractions is I need to create um, a 35 here and a 35 here in order for these two to be combined and added. I need a common denominator. So in order to make this a fraction that has a denominator of 35, I got to multiply the bottom here by five. Well, okay, seven times five is 35. But whatever I do to the bottom, I also have to do to the top. Okay, 19 times five is 95. This looks like a three, this is a five. So 19 sevenths is equivalent to 95 30 fifths. One is unsimplified. However, they are equivalent. They represent the same portion of a shaded, you know, full piece of something. This one, I need um, to multiply the denominator by seven to make 35. But whatever I do to the bottom, I do to, to the top. Three times seven is 21. So three fifths is equivalent to 21 35ths in fraction form. Whatever I do to the bottom, I have to do to the top. But now I have a common denominator. Keep the bottom. Do not change, you don't add the bottom. You do not add the bottom, you only add the numerator. Once you get to this point where you have a common denominator, you do not add the bottom. You maintain the bottom and you add the top. 116 out of 35 um, is my answer as an improper fraction. But if my answer asks me to put it um, as a mixed number, because remember, sometimes you're asked to add or subtract mixed numbers, if you want to do it this way, where you're converting it into an improper fraction first, you got to go back into mixed number if they're asking for the answer as a mixed number. Honestly, as you get into higher level math, we don't see mixed numbers a lot. We do improper fractions. But at, at you know uh, middle school and such, you do see a lot of mixed numbers. So um, 116 divided by 35. 35, let's see. 35 times two and 70, that's probably it. 35 times three, play with numbers. How many times does 35, oh, goes into three? Three times, 35 goes into 116 three times. Three times 35 is 105. I subtract here, <clears throat> I get 11. If I had another number, I'd bring it down. I don't, so I'm gonna get three holes and 11 35ths. That's my answer. Personally, like I said, I like to do improper fractions first. If I have to convert it into mixed number after, I will. I prefer to keep it as a, um, well, improper fraction to deal with my uh, situation. Multiplication and division are almost the same. However, you have to know how to multiply fractions before you can divide because division goes into multiplication. Now I do it a specific way. Let me show you what I mean. Um, 35 over 
let's see, 24 times, um, let's see, 21 and 36. All right, made up random numbers. I personally, I like to simplify before I multiply. Um, and because it's multiplication, you're allowed to do this. This is only for multiplication of fractions, only. <clears throat> Anything on top that has something in common with the bottom can be simplified. I prefer to simplify before multiplying because if I have to deal with bigger numbers and simplifying bigger numbers, I don't like that. That's a pain in my butt. It takes me longer. <laughs> Um, what I'm looking for is anything on top that has something in common with the bottom. So could do a couple of things. We could say, well, 36 is divisible by three and 21 is also divisible by three. So what I can do is divide them both by three. Whatever I do to the top, I have to do to the bottom. If I divide 36 by three, I get 12. If I divide 21 by three, I get seven. I am simplifying that fraction. Now, 35 and 24 don't have anything in common. However, I can go across too. What I mean by that is 35 and seven are both divisible by seven. Now, only if it's a number on top and a number on the bottom. I can't do like 35 and 12. That's, they're both on top. Has to be a number on top and on the bottom. Only if it's multiplication, because technically, you know, what are you doing? You're multiplying across the top and multiplying across the bottom. Um, so both 35 and seven can be divided by seven. So I divide seven by seven, which is one. And I divide 35 by seven, which is five. This is my personal preference and I'll show you why. Can I continue? Yes, 12 and 24 have something in common. 12 is on top, 24 is on bottom. This is gonna work. 12 is divisible by 12. 12 divided by 12 is one. 24 is divisible by 12. 24 divided by 12 is two. I'm gonna keep going until there's nothing else on top and on the bottom that can be simplified, which there is not because five and two have nothing in common and then one and one. Now I'm gonna multiply across the top. Five times one is five. Two times one is two. If I want to create um, this as a mixed number, five divided by two, two goes into five. One, uh, sorry, twice. Two times two is four. Subtract. This is two wholes and then one half, depending on how you want your answer, right? This is only if you have an improper fraction at the end and you're asked to convert it to mixed number. Why the heck do I prefer this? Uh, some people, like, you probably are sitting there like, well, what the heck did, did I just do? I personally prefer to do it like this because otherwise I have to go 35, um, 35 times 36. Oops, 35. I'm using my phone calculator and I never press the right buttons with that. 35 times 36 is 1,260. 24 times 21 is 504. And now I have to simplify this. If you want to do it that way, by all means, you get the same answer, you know? But now I have to find a common factor of 1,260 and 504. And who knows how many times I have to divide over and over to get to five halves. This is a, again, preference, whatever the heck you feel comfortable with. I like to what I call pre-simplify before I multiply. And again, it's anything on top that is something in common with the bottom. Technically, I'm going to do that again. The reason is because when I do a division of fractions, I have to multiply anyway. KFC. Keep the first, flip the second, change the sign to multiplication. Um, <clears throat> uh, let's see, dividing. So 21 over 52 divided by 14 over four. I'm dividing fractions, okay? Um, if I'm dividing fractions, I have to KFC. Keep the first, keep the first. Okay, keep it, just copy it. Flip the second, flip it. It's called a reciprocal, flip that fraction. 
and change the sign now to multiplication and you do your multiplication exactly how we just did it. So division converts into multiplication. You have to know how to multiply. So division is not hard if you can multiply because you just have to KFC and then multiply. Multiplication is where you need to focus if you um, have an issue, right? Then you could do division. So again, I'm gonna do this again. Anything on top that has something in common with the bottom, I'm gonna simplify. So I see 21 and 14 are both divisible by seven. They have a common factor. 21 divided by seven is three. 14 divided by seven is two, okay? If I want to do this, four and two, okay? Four and two are both divisible by two. Two divided by two is one. Four divided by two is two. Anything on top that is something in common with the bottom? Um, Trying to find the next color, pink. 52 and two are both divisible by two. So again, um, let's see. Um, anything on top that is something in common with the bottom. So two is on top, 52 is on the bottom. Two divided by two is one. 52 divided by two is 26. <clears throat> then I take a look and I see if I can simplify any more. In this case, I can't because three and 26 don't really have a common factor other than one. Um, so now I can go across the top. Three times one is three. 26 times one is 26. This should not have to be simplified if I did all my simplifying process prior. But you always want to make sure you can't simplify anymore. So addition and subtraction, common denominator. Whether you're dealing with mixed numbers or not, if you like this method where you convert the mixed number to an improper fraction first, and then if you need to, convert it back to mixed number, only if you're asked. Um, you could do all of these as such, okay? Up to you. There are other methods too. Um, okay, simplifying fractions. So I wanna do, mm, okay. I wanna make sure I cover everything. Sequences, arithmetic, versus geometric. These sequences are really important. They're the most common sequences and you can go into a lot of detail with them. But I think for now, you guys are just identifying which is which. Arithmetic sequences have a common difference. Mm, same number being added, put it like that. And I might be going a little further than you need, but Geometric sequence has a common ratio. Same number being multiplied. So I'll show you an example. Okay. What is a sequence <laughs> to begin with? It's a list of numbers. So like, uh, here's a list of numbers. It's a sequence of numbers. Does this sequence have a pattern? If it does, what is the pattern? Well, sometimes you'll be asked to maybe play around with it, identify a pattern. You have, you know, obviously be able to identify patterns. But in this case, it's a specific pattern. Is it arithmetic? Is it geometric? So <clears throat> in this case, it looks like the pattern is like, what it looks like I'm adding three to each number to get to the next one. So this is an arithmetic, uh, you know this, sequence, where what we call the common difference is three. Why is it called the common difference? Because you could find it by taking the second term, subtracting the first, I get three. If I take the third term and subtract the second, I also get three, right? Common difference is what we call it. But that's how you know if it's arithmetic, if it's the same number being added to each term to get to the next one. Geometric sequence um, could look like, I'm gonna make 
I guess it's a little bit harder. These are a little bit more complicated. They could be a little easier than this, but I'm trying to do a little harder one. I know that this is geometric because it has a common ratio because the same number is being multiplied um, by each term to get to the next one. And what do I mean by that? Well, if you notice, to get from four to two, you're dividing by two, but dividing by two is the same thing as multiplying by one half. Does that stand here? I forgot my one here. Oopsies. My geometric sequence is a little bit off because I need a one here for it to be a full geometric sequence. Now it's full geometric because, oops, I'm going from two to one. And I have to have a common ratio. If I don't have a common ratio, it's not geometric, right? Everything has to be multiplied by the same number. Two times one half is one. One times one half is one half. You know, one half times one half is one fourth and so on and so forth. And this is called a common ratio um, because of the fact that if I take the second term and divide it by the first, two over four is one half. If I take the third term, one, and divide it by the second, one half, I get the same thing. That's how you determine the common ratio for geometric. So geometric um, sequences have a common ratio, same number being multiplied, and arithmetic sequences have the same number being added. So they're specific patterns. These are not the only patterns for sequences, but they're specific. So you might be asked for these specific patterns on top of others, just so you know those specific. And you're not really going into a lot more detail other than that. Um, percentages. I'm trying to cover as much as I can. Um, I don't know that I'm going to have a heavy computer tonight, but I'll take it off tonight. Percentages. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I like to, I mean, first of all, you know, um, when you're converting a decimal to a percentage, you're moving the decimal two places to the right. You know, if I have 0 0.3 in percentage form, 30%, right? Move the decimal two places to the right, which is the same thing as multiplying by 100. So some of you think about it that way, and some of you think about it just moving the decimal. But um, specifically, percentage equations. So something like 20% of 15 is what number? Now, I'm going to convert this question, I'm gonna call this A, into an equation. And I'm gonna follow the same process for any of these questions when I convert it into equations. So let me show you what I mean. I see a percentage, I'm gonna convert it into decimal. Right, so 20% as a decimal is 0.2, because if I were to convert this into percentage, move the decimal two places to the right, from percentage to decimal, move it two places to the left. Um, of in mathematics is multiplication. 15 is 15. Is is an equal sign. What number is an unknown? Call it a variable, call it x. I have 0.2 times 15 is equal to x. I converted this um, statement, this question, into an equation, which now I can just go ahead and do 0.2 times 15. I'm going to do it fast. 3 is equal to x. So 20% of 15 is 3. <clears throat> that is pretty direct, right? Um, any part of this equation could be unknown. So what I mean by that is, 35%, that's a five, of what number is seven? I'm <laughs> making it up as I go. 35% of what number is seven? I see the percentage. I convert it into a decimal. 
in decimal form is 0.35. I see of, of converts into the multiplication symbol in mathematics. What number is an X? That's an unknown. We use a variable to represent an unknown. Is, is an equal sign, seven is seven. 35% of what number is seven? Same thing as saying 0.35x is equal to seven. Create this little equation that you need to use to solve and then solve it. Hopefully we're good with solving these. I have to divide both sides by 0.35 to isolate x. I get x, um, this creates a one in front of x. It's called an inverse operation. If I'm multiplying 0.35 times x, dividing 0.35 by 0.35 will make it cancel. Um, seven divided by 0.35 is 20. So 35% of what number of 20 is seven. And I can verify that if I want to check it. I can take 35% of 20 and make sure that it's seven. Again, any part of this could be my unknown, but I'm doing the same thing every time. Um, this one is a little special, has one extra step. What percent of 15 is 25? This is going to be a couple interesting processes. Anyway, what percent? Let's do the same thing that we just did. I have an extra something special on this problem, but I'll show you what I mean at the end. So what percent? Now my percent is unknown. I'm still going to call it X, but remember that the percent in the equation form is in decimal form. I have to convert it to percent at the end because it's asking me what percent. But this is the unknown here. The of is multiplication. 15 is 15. Is converts to an equal sign. And 25 converts to 25. So I have x times 15 equals 25. So this would be 15x equals 25 when, when I write it out in its proper equation form, right? X times 15, 15x. Same thing, isolate my variable, divide both sides by 15. I want it in decimal form because I want to know what percent, right? So 25 divided by 15, I'll do that. Of course, it would be an ugly number. Um, I'm going to round to the nearest tenth of a percent. I'll show you what I mean. Tenth of a percent. Okay. Um, 25 divided by 15 is 1.66666. Okay. Now, <laughs> here's the interesting part. Okay. Because the X represented a percent, I have to remember this. I have to convert it back into percentage form. But this is an interesting one because when I move the decimal two places to the right, I get 166.66%. Well, first of all, the percent is greater than 100. Does that make sense? Well, what percent of 15 is 25? 25 is bigger than 15. So I'm going above 100%, correct? It has to be a percent that's greater than 100 to increase this number. Now, um, on top of that, I'm asked to round to the nearest tenth of a percent and the tenths place in percentage form is here. And so I have to look to the number to the right of that and ask, well, is that number five or greater? And if it is, then this will go up to in seven. So a couple of things. First, the unknown is the percentage, which I still represent as a variable, but I have to remember that that variable converts to a percentage at the end. So in, in the equation form, it's represented as a decimal. So when I convert it or when I need it, back as my answer, I have to convert it back to a percent. If my number grew, what percent of 15 is 25? It's possible to get a percentage that's greater than 100% when I'm doing calculations of percentage. I'm gonna do one more. What percent of 10 is three? 
one, Jackie. We'll just make it two, make it nice and easy. So you see what I mean on an easy one. So let's do this again. Maybe you guys already recognize the answer. The what percent? That's an unknown. X. The of converts to multiplication. 10 is 10. Is converts to an equal sign. And 2 is 2. So I have x times 10 is equal to 2, or 10x equals 2. I'm going to go back. Same thing. Divide both sides by 10 to isolate my variable. <clears throat> and go back to my other color here. I get x is equal to 2 over 10, which is 0. 0.2. Now, I got to check. Did X represent a percent? It did. So now I have to convert it to places to the right to a percentage. What percent of 10 is 2? 20%. And that makes sense. I'm decreasing that number. This is less than 100%. Figured I would do an example like that too to make it interesting. Um, let me see. I want to make sure I cover at least the majority scientific notation, rationalizing. Let me do a, a little bit of rationalizing and then I'm gonna stop. So rationalizing is really important because if I have something with a radical on the bottom, I have to clear the radical. We never leave a square root on the bottom of a fraction. That is considered unsimplified. So this is an ugly unsimplified value to us mathematicians, right? Um. So how do I rationalize this? Well, the way to do that and what rationalizing means is get rid of the square root on the bottom in this case. I basically need to move it. I'm not going to have it on the bottom. I want it on the top. And the way to do that is to multiply the bottom by the square root of seven. But whatever I do to one, to, to, um, whatever I do to the bottom of a fraction, I have to do to the top. Why does that work? Well, when I go two times square root of seven, I really can't do anything with that because two is outside of a radical and seven is inside. So I cannot multiply the two and the seven, but this seven and this seven, I'm gonna probably show all my steps, can be multiplied. This is multiplication, right? I can do that. The square root of seven times the square root of seven is the same as the square root of seven times seven which if I continue to simplify is the square root of 49. Now I'm just copying the numerator because that's not changing. Can't really do much with that. It's the denominator that's simplifying. Why does this happen? Why does this work? Because now the square root of 49 will simplify because 49 is a perfect square. This will simplify into seven. And this is my rationalized expression. So you're always multiplying, I'll do one. 5 over the square root of 3. You're always multiplying the top and bottom by the square root of the bottom to rationalize. So this one multiplied by the square root of 3 on the top and on the bottom. And eventually, you're going to get to the point where you kind of skip those middle steps because you get used to it. 5 times the square root of 3. Why does this work? Now I could do the square root of the total three times three. Because what does that do? It creates that perfect square underneath that allows me to simplify and get rid of the radical on the bottom. And thus, this is a fully rationalized expression. <clears throat> I'm going to stop there. Um, common factors, GCF, you know, common multiples, these are things that I think you're good with PEMDAS, operations with integers. You know, I want to make sure that you guys, you, you know, that when you have, you're multiplying two numbers that are, um, that are negative, you get a positive, you deal with, you, you know how to deal with integers, you know, two plus negative three. If you want to deal with addition, like operations with integers. What I say sometimes is, you know, if, if I ask somebody to do two plus negative three and they're like, I don't know, 
when I go, all right, cool. I have two dollars and I spend three dollars. You guys tell me, oh, I'm in the net. I'm in. The, I'm in the debt. Like I'm in the hole a dollar. Same thing as you know, negatives. Negative is like you're in the hole. Um, this is the same thing as two minus three. Five minus eight is the same thing as five plus a negative eight. I have five dollars. I spent eight. I'm in the hole three. Basically, when you're adding two numbers. Um, with opposite signs, you take the sign of the larger number. And I think if I deal with, you know, money, it makes sense. I'm in the whole $2. I spend three. Now I'm in the whole $5. When I have the same sign, combine the numbers and just maintain the sign. So this is, you know, adding and subtracting integers, right? You could think about it as money. Um, with multiplication, you know, five times negative three, um, you know, when I have an odd number of negatives, I get a negative outcome. Negative two times negative two is positive four. When I have pairs of negatives, I get a positive outcome. You know what I mean by that is, if I multiply negative two three times, I know the outcome is going to be negative because I have an odd number of negatives. But negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4. Positive 4 times negative 2 is negative 8. <clears throat> this is just kind of, you know, as you start getting used to it, a quick way of doing these. All right. But if I have negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2, I have an even number of negatives. I know it's going to be positive. Um, negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4. You know, if I'm doing order of operations, multiplication and division from left to right, I get negative 8 times negative 2, 16. This is positive 16. Um, so... PEMDAS, um, okay. PEMDAS is kind of dealing with all of this as well. Parentheses, parentheses, exponents. You have to go in this order. Now the M and D I put together because it's multiplication and division from left to right. So it's not um, like multiplication before division, it's whatever comes first. A and S come together too because it's addition and subtraction from left to right. So same idea there. And this, you just kind of have to play with these. You gotta have, you just have to practice them. And I'm sending you these notes, so you don't have to write this down. You can have the notes next to you if you want, or um, write your own notes from these notes, okay? You know, 2 plus 5 squared minus 3 times 6, right? If I'm doing this, I want to do PEMDAS. I'm simplifying this expression. PEMDAS says parentheses, so I have to do the 2 plus 5, that's 7. I'm doing one thing at a time. I'm copying everything else down. I'm not dealing with thinking about anything else. I'm doing that first. Then I look at it again and I go, all right, what's next? Well, parentheses are done, exponents. Seven squared is 49. I'm copying everything else down. I'm not changing anything else. I did that one step. Now I look at it again, I go, what's next? Multiplication comes before subtraction. So I have to do this part first. I'm copying everything else down. I'm not changing anything else. I'm focusing on the one thing that I'm dealing with. Finally, okay, now it's subtraction. There's my answer. One step at a time. If you try to do too many steps in one shot, you might make a mistake with PEMDAS, with these things that have mixed operations, okay? One step at a time. Deal with that step, move on to the next. Then reanalyze. So this should... uh give you a nice gist as to what you guys will expect. 
um, on your midterm. And if you have any other questions, email me. Good luck. You could do this. You got this. Okay. And then once this is done, you know, the final doesn't, you know, these, this material chapters one through six, it's, it's, you know, technically done, you, you know, um, it's not going to be on the final, the final will cover weeks or chapters seven through 12. So you're halfway there. <laughs> so you got this. All right. Good luck.